This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Basin covers an area of almost 200,000 square kilometers and is central to the ecosystem of the East African region. Lake Victoria itself is the second largest freshwater lake in the world and also forms the mouth of the White Nile. Now for thousands of years populations in Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda have called the banks of this great lake home in addition to being a major source of their livelihoods, the local peoples here also have a deep cultural and spiritual connection to the lake. But in the last few decades, the ecosystem of the basin has been in a state of rapid deterioration, suffering the effects of pollution, climate change, and a devastating hyacinth invasion. This week on Talk Africa, we spend a day by Africa's largest lake, explore some of its history and take a look at some of the issues that are affecting it today. I'm Beatrice Marshall from the shores of Lake Victoria. Welcome to Talk Africa. The lake was named Lake Victoria by John Hanning Speak in 1858. It is known as Namulolwe in the local Doluo dialect or Nalubale in Luganda. Well, to start us off on this journey of the lake and why it is so important for the local community, Paul Obala has called this place home for the last 60 years. He has a fascinating story about the evolution of life on the lake. Uh, Paul, you have lived here for so long. You have a really interesting story living here in Kisumu and around the lake uh, for over 60 years. Uh, tell us about your life here. Wakati wa zamani tulikuwa tunaenda kufua na baba. Na wakati huo ilikuwa samaki ilikuwa nyingi. Kwa sababu tulikuwa tunatumia tu jangwe kwa kufua. Tukienda kwa maji inafika tu kwa goti tuna surround Iyo jangwe tunatoa samaki nyingi tunakula zingine tunaenda naye kwa zuku tunapata hela na hizo hela ndiyo nimeenda naye shule nilienda mpaka form 4 nikamaliza nikafanya O level 1977 nikamaliza nikaanza kazi huko Thika huko nilifanya mpaka 1990 Wakati really sasa ilikuwa ina yumba yumba, niyo tukapewa send off, nikakuja nae hapa kisumu, nikaanza nae biasara, ya kuyovuvi. You started a life again on the lake, you went back to the lake. What have you seen since the time you were fishing with your father up until today? What is the difference? Ilikuwa mzuri kwa sababu atoku kwa tukienda kununua net kwa sababu wakati huwa haikuwa na net. Tulikuwa tu tukisona hii zambi, tunaenda nae tu kwa maji, tuketembea mgu, atu kwa hata na boat, tunaenda tu kwa mgu, ikifika maji, ikifika kwa goti, tuna surround hiyo zambi, tunafua enje, samaki inapatikana. Tukienda asubuhi sa kuminambili, ikifika sambili, tayari tume, tumepata hile samaki ya kutosa, ya kupereka sukuni, Ya what about today? Ah, uh, wakati huu, tunaenda sa kumi jioni, paka keso sa moja subui. Ile kati tutapata, ni kidogo, ile awezi pereka hata mtoto sule. So, what, what sort of challenges are you finding in your fishing? Because I'm also seeing that the boats that you, you, you are using are still um, 
you know, uh, uh, very traditional boats. What sort of challenges are you facing in your, in your venture? The challenge, one challenge is because there is no face, the second one, we as fishermen, even loans we are not to get. That's why we are poor. When you look at the situation today, how long do you think this lake is going to continue providing you with a livelihood? Kama ni nyingi ni mwaka tatu ene toe na kuja. Imebaki itu maji ya kuwago. What do you see as uh, the problem? Like why has the fish become so depleted over the years? Ne i jams in atoka kwa factories and again kuna una unajua government walikuwa wanafunga bari kwa six months in a year. Watu wanafua six months six month in a ban. Lakini iyo seria wale vota. Sasa siku hizi tunaenda through mchana usiku from January up to December. Sasa masamaki imeheza. Thank you very much, Paul. Well, Lake Victoria is still central to the livelihoods of many who live by its banks. Fishermen today still ply these waters to catch fish for sale as well as feed their families. But as we've just heard from Mze Paul, it is becoming increasingly difficult. Fishermen have to go further out because of overfishing, the hyacinth scourge, and also because of the increasing levels of pollution in the lake and its environs. Well, Paul Diddy has fished these lakes since he was a boy and is going to take us on a boat to the present day fishing grounds. Paul, uh, thank you very much. Tell me about your life on the lake, how you started, what do you do, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis? I've been fishing for around 10 years. So I started fishing by going to with my father in the lake. So my father taught me how to fish. When we go to fish, always, mm -hmm. you usually get uh, uh, fish and then we sell for us to earn something. How much? Like uh, for 500 daily. So com compare for me when yes. you started, how much fish you used to get when you started and how much fish you are getting now. So that, I mean, now you cannot even afford the equipment. So long, when, we, when, I, started, when I started fishing, we used to get around, uh, we used to catch the big fish, like around uh, 80 kgs. That's one fish. Now it's easy when I put a camera, so I can see how it looks easy, as you go. Because when when you want to me, the wrong method of fishing, they are using the small nets. So to get your fish yes. today, now, how far do you have to go? You have to go the other side. You know, the the even you look at the end, mm -hmm. you can see some boats over there. So there, if when we go there, you can just get enough the bigger fish. Yeah, so the deeper places where we can get the big fish. How far, how far is it from the shore? It's like uh, 200 kilometers from here. How long does it take you? Uh, like uh, three hours. So I see your boat is leaking. It has a lot of water, you know. I, I have to keep uh, getting the water out because yes. otherwise I will be sitting in water throughout the whole time. So tell me about the, your boat, why it looks like the way it looks. So because of there's no fish, so we can't get enough money to repair the boat. This boat is uh, eight, eight years old. Is it boat? Zote lazima zile inkizi. Zote? Zote. Sasa hii unarepair, unakuwa unarepair wakati gani? After, after five years. Aha. Lafu naitawa, unatawa hizi and then unareplace. Kwa hama zile inkizi gine kama hii, hii na hii badai kwa strong. Sasa unatawa hizi, hizi na hizi kuna crack hizi. Unatawa unareplace na the the new ones. What sort of challenges do you, are, are you seeing now, you know, during your, your, your work as a fisherman? What kind of challenges do you face? We have this what you call water synth. Water synth, kama water synth zimekuja, zina, zina beba zisamaki zota zinarudi nayo. And then zinaribu net zetu pair. 
Yeah. Sasa so, unaweza weka net yako hapa, then kesho kama umerudi, unapata kama net yako haiko. Sasa hiyo water synth na baba hiyo net inaenda nayo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the water synth zina move na upepo. As it kui one place. Mm -hmm. Yes. How long do you think it's it's you know going to be conducive to continue fishing? Future ya li Lake Victoria. Now it is if the, uh, like now there's no fish. So now we are we are doing we are doing boat riding. Tunapeleka wageni. Sasa hiyo ndio kazi yenye tuna tunafanya hapa sasa. Sasa hiyo boat riding peke yake. Na hiyo kupeleka watu kwa lake na boat. Hizi motorist boat. Na umejua hizi motorist boat pia zinatumia petroli. Sasa hiyo inaleta effect na this face amaki zinakuwa affected. Na hiyo cuz engine zinatumia oil na petrol. Na hizo ndio water pollution. What would you like the authorities or what, what would you like the government to do to, you know, to help the fishermen here? So, government anafaa wafunge, wafunge lake, wafunge lake for like uh, three months, ili samakizi grow. Alafu, wat, wa, waambie watu, waji, wa, wa, wavuvi, watumie, wanunue net yao mzuri mzuri, and then wakue na love jackets, ili umejua kama ume, umeanguka kwa lake, this jacket can help can help me to float on, on top of the water, mm -hmm. for me not to die. Paul, thank you so much, and what an interesting life you've had here on Lake Victoria. We'll let you get on with the rest of your day. For now, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue with our journey by Africa's largest lake. Stay with us. Life by Lake Victoria carries on, despite the many challenges the local people are facing now. The fish market at Dunga Beach in Kisumu used to be much larger than it is today, but the depletion of fish stock has meant that local residents have had to look for alternative sources of income. Well, to find out more about the degradation of Lake Victoria from a scientific point of view, we are here at the Maseno University to speak with Dr. Eric Ogelo, who has been conducting research on the lake for over 10 years. You have two samples of water here at various, uh, from the lake at various levels of cleanliness or dirtiness. Tell us about that. This sample was you know, taken from the Winam Gulf. Now, Winam Gulf is bordering Kisumu town. And you can start to imagine uh, the kind of effluence. Uh, you can see this water is clouded with algae, and that's why it's green in nature. Now, the danger of having uh, too much algal bloom is that it deprives uh, the water of oxygen. And that oxygen is very key for the survival of the aquatic biodiversity. Now this sample uh, was, was, was obtained from uh, several kilometers in the lake and you can see this is clearer mm -hmm. and that means there are some parts of the lake that are not really uh, disturbed in terms of uh, a nu nu nut nutrient imbalance. Looking at where we are today, what is the biggest problem facing Lake Victoria? The biggest problem facing Lake Victoria ecosystem is, um, let me say, pollution. Because, uh, yes, we have done uh, certain activities to ensure the lake is clean, mm -hmm. but we have not done a lot in the ecosystem. And I would say ecosystem approach to Lake Victoria management is very, very important. So even if we can clean the lake itself, but we are not stopping effluence from uh, farmlands, from industries mm -hmm. still coming into the lake, then it means the problem will still recur. And that has been a big, big problem. 
in Lake Victoria. All right. So I want you to give me a, a scenario, best case scenario, um, in terms of trying to rehabilitate the lake to the way it was in the 1960s. Is that possible? And how much effort could it take to rehabilitate the lake? One of the very robust uh, approach is what we call an ecosystem approach to Lake Victoria management. So that we start managing the lake from the source where the waters come, all the way from Mao region and, and other riverine areas. So we look at uh, it in terms of who are the farmers there, what kind of fertilizers are they using, what quantities are they using, who is cutting forest, you know, because that will then stop the storm water coming with a lot of fertilizers mm -hmm. and organic waste. That is very key. Number two is about uh, provision of alternative livelihoods. Mm -hmm. Again, this is coming in the form of aquaculture. So I know the government has promoted aquaculture uh, very, very intensely. And we also, as scientists, we are also teaching communities how they can invest in aquaculture because uh, aquaculture is farming fish out of the main water. People say, yes, when this is their source of livelihood, so you cannot stop them from going to the lake. But then, can we therefore give them alternatives so that they can let the lake regain in terms of its biodiversity? If the lake, uh, if the damage is not halted, worst case scenario? Then we are talking about tragedy of the commons. Remember, if you don't care, I don't care, and he does, she doesn't care. The ecosystem will collapse, definitely, because we are talking about less than 10 species of fish in the lake, all the way from 300 species in a span of, uh, of three decades. So that's a very worrying trend. If we continue like that, maybe in the next uh, 10 or 20 years or so, we are going to have a barren lake or a desert lake. All right, uh, Dr. Ogelo, thank you very much. From a scientific perspective, the environment and ecosystem of the Lake Victoria Basin does require more concerted efforts in order to improve and return the lake to its former healthy state. Well, let's find out what the county government of Kisumu is doing to ensure it does not get worse and what efforts are being put in place to help the local community. We've talked to a lot of people and they have their sentiments about the lake, but for, perhaps I'd like first to hear it from you. Um, what is your impression of Lake Victoria? Well, my impression of Lake Victoria is that it's a lake that has been used in the past for maritime transport and, and fishing, mainly. As years passed by, uh, agricultural production on land intensified especially through sugarcane growing and the sugar industries that came up upstream. All these led to the emitting of a lot of affluence into the lake for many years. When hyacinth first appeared on the lake, you know, hyacinth is a weed that grows on water as a result of affluence. And because nothing was done for a long time, it increased. Fortunately, since I became governor, uh, the Kenyan government came forth and started reviving the port, dredging the port, cleaning the port, and, and resuming maritime transport, especially through MV Uhuru. And because of that cleanup of the, of the port and getting rid of uh, people who are washing cars in, in the water and other, other businesses, uh, the port started becoming clean. Okay. And it's very interesting that after a very short period of time, we saw the effect. So when you look at the rehabilitation efforts that have been done since, as you mentioned, uh, you came, uh, you became governor, and, and, and all this is going back to 1987, all the interagency collaborations, what percentage would you say Lake Victoria has achieved in terms of rehabilitation? Although we still have a lot of work to do, I would say that the re re rehabilitation work is about 40% done because we still have a lot to do. We still have a lot to do in the sense that in the riparian land where people encroached and put up houses and businesses and so on, that itself is not good for the lake. 
because that has part, part and parcel of the ecological life of the lake. Now that we have not really done much on, especially following the rise on the level of the lake recently, because the level of the lake rose and those who have built past the riparian land or riparian land itself were actually swallowed by the, the, the rise of the water. Some of those buildings and businesses have not been recovered. At the moment, we have what we call the, the Lake Front Development Corporation, a corporation created by the county to deal with issues of the lake front. And the Lake Front Development Corporation has been looking into these various uh, ways of, of, of restoring the health of the lake shore. So we talked to a number of uh, fishermen on the lake who've, who've done their activities on the lake for many years, 10 years, uh, 30 years, and they're talking about uh, a real depletion of uh, fish in the lake. What do we know about that? Well, part of it is the mistake of the fishermen themselves, really, that they were using nets to fish, which were not conducive to a higher reproduction of fish in the lake because they were fishing fingerlings, or very young fish. And once you do that, you, you interfere with the reproduction process of the lake, of, of the fish. You see, uh, our fishermen have not really had good, very good fishing practices, okay? And I think that in itself must be improved. One of the things we must do as a government is to create an enabling environment for fishermen to get good fishing gear at a price they can afford, but also make sure regulations on what kind of nets and gear to use for fishing is something that is conducive to a higher reproduction of fish on the lake than it is now. So in terms of uh, creating an enabling environment for, for the fishermen, and some of these fishermen talked about perhaps from next year not being able to fish. Is there a secondary source of livelihood that will be encouraged? And, and on that note as well, are there other commercial, commercially viable ventures that you're looking into uh, in terms of Lake Victoria? Yeah, we've been talking to Victoria Farms. You know, Victoria Farms is... Uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a large company that has established cage fishing in the lake, uh, actually fish farming really on the lake using cages. And our discussions with them is that, yes, you are experts in this field. We want to work with you, but we also want you to use uh, small fishermen as outgrowers. You know what I mean? that they, they, you, you can give them the, the cages and work with them so that they can do this fishing in a manner that is scientific uh, with higher productivity. And we think that cage farming is the, the, is the way to go. Dr. Nanyongo, thank you very much. Thank you. Aside from government efforts, there are non-governmental organizations working in the region to try and reverse the environmental challenges the local people are facing and also teach them ways they can improve on their lives. One of these is the Friends of Lake Victoria, better known as Osienala. We caught up with its deputy director, Dr. Godfrey Ogonda, to tell us more. Dr. Ogonde, thank you. Now, I, I'm looking for an explanation to what this is because when I walked into the compound, I thought it was grass, but it is actually a water mass with uh, some green uh, plant on top of it. What is this? Yeah, this is what we call algae. Algae is actually a plant, and when it occurs in a, lot, a lot like it has occurred now, we, then we call it algae bloom. So there's an algae bloom in the lake. And this is due, basically, usually to due to pollution, which is in the lake. So when you talk about the uh, pollution in Lake Victoria, where exactly is it coming from? What are the sources? The pollution comes from two main sources. So we have what we call the point sources of pollution and the nine point sources of pollution. The point sources of pollution are those points, pollution sources that you can go and pinpoint. For example, you can go and pinpoint an industry. You can go and pinpoint a, a, a sewage treatment plant. Non-point sources are those others that you cannot pinpoint. For example, the farmers who are farming in the highlands or around the lake basin, they, and they use their, the, the fertilizers, they spray their plants using the, the, the different spray for insect sites and things like that. 
the, 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 the solid waste which, which are being dropped here and there by people who are working. So these are what we are calling nine point sources. You cannot pinpoint them and say this is now coming from so and so. It is all of them collectively together. So we call them nine point sources of pollution. So when you talk about the point and the nine point sources, for the nine point sources specifically, how far out are they? The, the nine point sources are come from as far as maybe even a hundred kilometers. Actually, the basin, uh, as we are talking about, is about 180,000 kilometers square. That is excluding this water surface. 180,000 kilometers square, that's a very big area. So for our region, because of the highlands here, we talk almost 100 kilometers. So as far as maybe Kakamega, Nandi Hills and things like that. So these, all these things find their way into the lake. Whether it's a fertilizer you have used, whether it's a polythene paper you have dropped on the road, whether it is uh, somebody who has gone for a, a long call in the forest, all these find their way into the lake. So basically the lake is like the dumping site for all this waste which is coming in. So it, it looks like it, it, there really needs to be a concerted effort, both from the community, uh, from non-governmental organizations, uh, from the government individually. What can each do? And, and at this point as we speak, what actually is going on? What is each of those sec sectors, what are they doing? The, the point sources, of course, there is a lot of effort with the government agencies, including the county government. That one I, I agree. So they do a lot of work. But these point sources which they are addressing requires a lot of resources. Most of the time you find that you spend a lot of resources to get rid of the kind of those kind of pollution. So for example, to improve like a sewage treatment plan, you put a lot of resources. But uh, for the other land point sources, the cost we have realized is very low. Because most of the time it's like just teaching or capacity building people on sensitizing them. And that's what the work of the NGO is doing most of the time, like Osianala. So we teach the people, individuals. So the individual's effort, for example, whoever small, and most of them it is costless, it doesn't cost money. Somebody changing his behavior, for example, not using the other fertilizers, which are uh, uh, chemical fertilizers, for example, and using organic fertilizer or somebody not to, uh, dropping waste into the road or into the river or directly into the lake. So these are efforts which are individuals, individuals can take and they cost less money. And it's just a matter of sensitizing and teaching and mobilizing the communities to act. And this actually has the majority of the pollutants into the lake as compared to the point sources. Dr. Ogonde, thank you very much. The diversity and beauty of the ecosystem in the Lake Victoria Basin is under threat from a combination of the hyacinth invasion, overfishing, pollution and climate change. In the Lake Victoria Basin alone, 30 million people derive their livelihoods from the lake, but it also impacts millions further afield as its waters feed into the White Nile. There are currently efforts being made to rehabilitate Lake Victoria. However, more concerted effort is needed to return the ecosystem of the entire region to its former healthy and sustainable condition. Well, we'd like to say a big thank you to all our guests on the program for their wonderful insights. And we'd also love to hear your feedback through our social media handles. From the shores of Lake Victoria in Kenya's Kisumu County, I'm Beatrice Marshall.